Hey, we are delighted, Phil, to be speaking on Easter Sunday and how fortuitous that 40 years ago we actually started on this um, whole um, journey together. And here we are today, still full of it, full of beans, full of vigour and wanting to proclaim the gospel. Yeah. And uh, can, can Valerie and I, we want to wish, they may not hear this today, but a huge congratulations to pastors Phil and Chris Pringle yeah. for their faithfulness, their faith, yeah. for their risk taking, which has always been a hallmark of who they are. And here 40 years later, as Phil mentioned before, 600 churches around the world. And uh, we don't quite know how it happened, but we certainly feel privileged to be part of it. We are doing over this next number of weeks, a series called All Things New. And uh, no better scripture um, describes this thought than Revelation 21.5. Revelation is that um, dark or strange or apocalyptic book at the end of our New Testament. And uh, whatever else it says, it speaks as much to our present as to the past and also to the future. And this is what John wrote. He said, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. This statement, this vision of John is as much a future promise as it is a present reality. Or should I say, it's as much a present reality as a future promise. God has begun the process of renewing all things, of making all things new. And even though there's an outcome to that process, we are part right now of God's renewing process. And that's nowhere to, we're better described than in that favorite scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And it reads like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. They are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And you know, one of the things this says to me is that, and the context also says this, that we're to look at each other differently. Mm. We're, to, we're to see each other differently. And part of what Paul is saying is this is that no longer do we see through, the, through the, the spectrum or the glasses of age or race or gender or whatever potentially divides us, but we are, to, we are now seen through the new spectrum of our shared identity in Christ. That's new. That's why the church is a revolution and a revelation because, and I'll explain how this came to pass in a moment, but the point is, is that, that newness of Christ, that's what identifies us. We no longer have the same arguments or the same divisions or the same problems, whole new possibilities, whole new ways of seeing each other. So that when Valerie and I look at each other, we're not just husband and wife. We're not just male and female. We're not just Australian and American, but we're actually one together in Christ. And that is making all things new, or at least it's very much a part of it. Also, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, encourages us, to, and it says this, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God. So it's not just enough to know that we are a new creation. We have to actually live like it, believe like it, act like it. It's not enough to know it on paper, on a piece of paper, but to know it in our hearts, in our consciousness, in our lifestyles. So here's the question. What made this all possible? Um, what event created this? And my friends, clearly in the New Testament, it's the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. After his crucifixion, he rose on the third day. We hinge our faith on this event. It's def decisive, it's defining, and it's of utmost importance. We could say that it's our, the ground zero of our faith. Paul said this, that he stakes our faith on the resurrection of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now, let me read from you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter. It talks about some of the, the issues of the resurrection. 
it says this, and I'm, I'm going to read quite a few verses. So if you're trying to fo follow sequentially, you might get a bit lost. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand firm. By this gospel, you are saved. Um, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then the 12, dot, 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 following on, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is worthless, and so is your faith. That's strong defining words. Further on, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's even worse than vain, isn't it? It's futile. You are still in your sins. That's a problem. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If our hope in Christ is for this life only, we are to be pitied more than all men. My friends, that's what I call laying on the line. It's the resurrection of Christ that made all this possible. Now, you and I know this fact. Dead men don't rise. We know that. But the record in the Gospels of Jesus is utterly compelling, and it tells us something quite different than that normal, settled, scientific, verifiable fact. And it's not just the ravings of disappointed or deluded men. Look, the whole record of itself is so exposing of them if they had tried to make it up. But to begin with, when the women came and present, the first people to present the gospel were the women, and they just didn't believe it. And even when he turned up, he was recognizable, yet somehow very different. Even then, they panicked, they freaked out. Um, you don't start a new religion by such doubt in the founders, much less do you mention it in that religion's history. And look, I've... We, some of us have read on this for years. Many theories have been put forward as to what really happened, but they are less credible than a physical, bodily, renewed resurrection. And most of them are clearly ridiculous. One's called the swoon theory, that Jesus swooned on the cross. <laughs> you don't swoon when your side's pierced with a sword. You don't swoon when you're, cruci well, you don't swoon when you're crucified. That's absurd. Jesus rose from the dead, friends. And if he rose from the dead, something new in the created order has happened. Something entirely new. Heaven and earth has come together in a new way. And, and new possibilities are made possible. A new creation. And the New Testament is very clear. As much as Genesis speaks of the old first creation, after the resurrection, there's a brand new creation. Faith sees it, lives it out. It's not just something pie in the sky. It's steak on your plate while you wait. Now, here's a thought. Um, that, well, here's the big thought. The, the most important and immediate thing that came out of this is that our sins are forgiven and a new power is made available to live. Not just sins forgiven, but a resurrection power that enables us to live a new life. Not just not doing things, but doing a whole new way of living. And look, who doesn't want that? If you think about it. Who's prepared to admit, maybe it's the question is, but who's prepared to admit that they sin and they admit those sins to God? Look, it's a blind person who doesn't face their own shortcomings, their own failings, and even at times their own personal acts of evil. And the Bible defines sin as missing the mark, falling short of the target. Most people who are reasonable identify with those struggles in their humanity. I think the counselor's couch or what we used to call a psychologist's couch, is proof of that. But, you know, God treats it differently than we do, much more seriously than we do. The son died a criminal's death. His life, his pure, spotless life, given for our faulted, failing lives. The most marvellous thing I've always thought, I've always thought this, the most marvellous thing about the gospel is that our sins are forgiven. That's remarkable. Um, and God does that in and through the action of Christ. It's our means of real freedom. S something our governments, our institutions, financial, educational, cannot ever do for us.
and they never could. Why we would ever look to them to provide true freedom, I don't know. And, and all the would-be revolutionaries out there, the world, freedom certainly does not come out of the barrel of a gun. Jesus said these words as we conclude, if the sun sets you free, you are really free. Not free to misbehave or to be foolish or to, to throw to, to, to the wind all caution or to act completely immorally. No, it's a freedom to love, a freedom to serve, a freedom to create, a freedom to express God's purpose in nature. And with this freedom comes real power. Uh, there's a lot of discussions about power these days, powers and corporation, men against woman power. But that's a weak version of real power. Real power is the power to love. Real power comes by the resurrection of Jesus. I, and I'm going to finish with these thoughts. Resurrection power is the power to love truly, madly, deeply. Resurrection power is the power to heal, something that Phil mentioned just before in his prayer. Resurrection power is the power to forgive others. Resurrection power is the power of faith, hope, and love. My friends, if ever we needed the power of the resurrection of Christ, recreating in our lives, recreating in our communities, in our world, it is now. From Valerie and I, happy Easter to all of you. Happy Resurrection Sunday, friends, family, and all who are listening. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now. Thank you.